All right, good afternoon again, everyone. First and foremost, I want to thank you all for joining the first in a series of webinars being hosted by the Global Services Association of Jamaica. Today's theme is strategies to attract new clients and grow your business. And we have three great panelists today, all of whom have years of experience in the BPO sector. We will now begin with the opening remarks from the president of the GSAJ, Ms. Gloria Henry. Good afternoon, everyone. I am very pleased to welcome everyone from an overcast and rainy Montego Bay. Welcome to our webinar series under the theme Uncertainty, Business Resilience, and the Future. The COVID-19 pandemic is a major disruptor across the globe at this time and has caused a great deal of uncertainty for many businesses. In Jamaica, many sectors and businesses have had adverse impact on their operations, but we are extremely thankful for the resilience and the responsiveness of the global services operators in Jamaica, which have experienced minimal impact. The government of Jamaica and several agencies have been very responsive and supportive of the sector over the last six months. Since the onset of the global pandemic, we've had support from government in rolling out our business continuity plans to operate a hybrid model with work at home supporting about half of the workforce, thus allowing the sector to continue to serve its customers all across the world uninterrupted. Jamaica's global services sector is now in its maturity stage. Before the pandemic, we had over 43,000 persons employed directly and we were on an upward trajectory with a very positive projection. But the COVID pandemic has reshuffled our deck somewhat, but we're still in the game with over 38,000 persons still employed and several sites with growth plans for the next quarter of 2020. Over the years, Jamaica's GSS has grown organically in the customer service segment and expanded strategically in many areas to include finance, accounting, human resources, sales, collections, and in recent times, information technology and legal process outsourcing. Over the next five months, the GSAJ will bring you a wide range of topics with discussions focused on key drivers of services and opportunities that will repurpose our future and demonstrate the strategic importance of Jamaica's GSS in the post-COVID pandemic and as a near shore location of choice. Naturally, we begin with where we have the largest concentration of services, and that is the BPO segment, focusing mainly on front office operations. The customer experience, or CX as it is known, is at the heart of all outsourcing contracts. Therefore, the presentation from Peter Ryan is applicable to all attendees. The focus is not on me, so I'm not going to be speaking for long. You will hear from our leading members in the CX environment, Peter Ryan, uh, Kayleen Eccles from ETEC Global Solutions, and then you will get a live testimonial from Jamaica's largest female-owned GSS company, Jacqueline Sutherland. Today's webinar is supported by Kale Reed, who is, will introduce our presenters and moderate the Q&A and Karen Shields, who is the official organizer of these events. Thank you for registering. We are here to serve you and happy that you have joined us and look forward to your participation in the next hour and a half. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Henry. Before we begin, I just want to note to all our attendees that we want this to be an interactive session. So as we progress, if there's anything you'd like to ask, the Q&A option in the webinar will be open throughout the presentations. So please don't hesitate. You can ask questions generally or direct them to a specific panelist and the questions will be answered at the end of all presentations. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist for the afternoon, Mr. Peter Ryan. Before I do, I'd just like to note that we will also have a poll which will pop up during the presentations as well. So please feel free to participate. So Mr. Peter Ryan is the Principal and Chief Analyst at Ryan Strategic Advisory, 
He has been at the forefront of contact center services market advisory for over a decade. He began his career in London at Data Monitor in 2003 and quickly established himself as one of the foremost experts in the burgeoning customer relationship management sector. Over the course of his career, he has advised contact center outsourcers, their clients, industry associations and governments on matters ranging from vertical market penetration and service delivery to best practices in offshore positioning. An experienced presenter, Mr. Ryan has participated as a keynote speaker in, a speaker in webinars throughout his career, especially this year. Some of the most recent include the Thin Scale Technology South African BPO webinar in May and the Jampro Nearshore BPO webinar in July. Peter has degrees in political studies from the University of Saskatchewan in Canada and an MBA from Dalhousie University. So without further ado, I will now hand over to our first presenter, Mr. Peter Ryan. Well, uh, Kelly, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And let me congratulate you. Very few people from outside Canada pronounce Saskatchewan properly. So uh, well done on that. Uh, I was very impressed. It's, it's a rarity. And it's great to be back speaking with so many friends from Jamaica today. And I'd like to sincerely thank the association for providing me with this opportunity to share with you a few of my own insights and what I've been picking up on, but, but more importantly, help drive interest in North America and, and help drive some insight around providers, service providers in Jamaica and what they need to do to prospect in the very lucrative markets of the United States and Canada. Now I've got a PowerPoint presentation that I'm gonna share with you for the next half hour or so. Uh, certainly I would reiterate what Kaylee was saying that this is gonna be an interactive session. So please, please, please share your questions, share your comments, share anything that you would like. Uh, I would be more than happy to take them up at the appropriate time as it relates to what you need to do to better position your organizations from the context of winning business in Canada and the United States. So I'm just gonna share my screen and hopefully technology will cooperate. It did a few minutes ago. There we go. And I'm gonna go into the presentation mode. There we are. I'm assuming everybody can see what I can see on the screen here. And effectively my, my presentation is titled, penetrating the North American front office services sector. And the whole idea about this is to give all the participants, the owners or the operators of service providers, a sense about what they need to do if they are to establish themselves as competitors within the, the context of the United States and Canada. So a little bit about what we're going to go over today. I'll start with a brief introduction, just a few points outlining what I'm gonna talk about. Then I'll talk a little bit about what some of the nuances are about the North American services market. And there are certainly, I think, elements of distinctiveness as it relates to both the United States and to Canada that, that really deserve to be drawn out. There's also considerations that need to be drawn out with regards to certain elements of the United States and the Canadian enterprise marketplaces, the buyers of services. And I wanna talk a little bit about those as it relates to revenue magnitude, as well as vertical in industries. Certainly from the standpoint of what an outsourcer needs to do to position itself in the US and Canada should not be underestimated. And with that in mind, I've got some thoughts a little bit about how an outsourcer that's looking to break into North America would want to try and position its services and to position what it can do best from a functional standpoint as it relates to what the buyers of these services are looking for. Obviously, we're here to talk about Jamaica and what's going on in Jamaica, especially amongst the dynamic group of local entrepreneurs that have really made, I think, the Jamaican outsourcing or the services sector what it is today. And we'll talk a little bit about how Jamaica relates to the US and Canada. Perhaps we'll talk about things that you already know about. There might be some surprises and we'll wrap it up with the, uh, at the end with a few conclusions. So just to start out, North America, as far as I'm concerned, presents a very solid opportunity for providers of services in Jamaica. It is, is truly a market where I think there's a lot of opportunity, there's a lot of chance to go out and win new business. And I think that one of the reasons for this is because of the fact 
that both the states and Canada are in the midst of a fair amount of disruption when it comes to how customer experience is delivered. And as Gloria mentioned, we know that CX is such a large part of what's going on in the services space when it comes to Jamaica. And it's so important to recognize about how these alignments can be found with the North American buying marketplace. We also know that shrinking budgets and that the budgets aren't necessarily as robust right now as they might have been a few years ago when it comes to managing the captive or the enterprise customer experience elements. And this is something that I think providers in Jamaica need to consider as, as a great opportunity in terms of how they position themselves. But also positioning themselves with regards to the right industry is going to be so, so crucial. Go after the industries of the lowest hanging fruit. And we'll talk a little bit about some of these and how they relate to Jamaica. I think from the standpoint of favorability, Jamaica is in a relatively enviable position right now when it comes to the United States and to Canadian buyers. It's a well-viewed location with a great track record. It's important when going out to win business in North America, whether it's in the US or Canada, to emphasize the strengths that Jamaica brings to the table from a services perspective on a frontline basis. And there's no question, there's many of them. But there's also misconceptions. And with the misconceptions in mind, it's important to consider what these are and to get ahead of those in order to exercise them from the minds of buyers before they become a problem or an obstacle to winning new deals. So with some of these introductory remarks uh, out of the way, what I'd like to do now is move into the, the gist, the, the meat of my presentation, by starting with some of the nuances as it relates to the services market in the United States and Canada. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about frontline services. And I thought I'd taken the animation out of this, so I'll just very quickly uh, put it up on the screen. Apologies for that. One of the things about Canada, when you're looking at the front office uh, services market, is it's dominated by large companies. It's mainly dominated by organizations that would be competing in multiple different geographies. Now, I think that this is really important because it's been a facet of the Canadian market for a long time, and it is a barrier potentially to entry when you consider how North America is going to play out. But equally important, and I was talking to Gloria about this yesterday, there's a lot of local disruptive players that are challenging the authority of these large, uh, these large global companies. And that's actually good because it's making the market more competitive and it's opening it up to competitors or to providers that might be in locations such as Jamaica. I think that when we take into account the fact that Canada has got a very conservative, uh, very conservative buying nature, enterprises tend to go with what they know. They tend not to go necessarily with uh, new or what they would perceive to be exotic solutions or exotic type uh, deals that are brought to, to the forefront when they're looking to try and figure out their CX strategy. They want to go with what they know. They're, they're very happy by going with a strategy that's worked for them before. Now, what's important to remember of this is that this tends to favor outsourcers that they've been working with for a long time. And it means that you can count on long lasting relationships and long lasting commercial relationships once you get in with a Canadian enterprise. There is concentrated regional buying. So when you're going to prospect in Canada, if that is the intention that you might have, think about the fact that you don't necessarily have to pan out across the country. You really got to concentrate on the locales that are most important where the, the regional concentrations of commercial power lie. Now, Toronto is obviously a logical first port of call, but equally there's a lot of headquarters and a lot of work that's going on from a CX standpoint, decision making wise that you need to think about that would be based in Calgary and Alberta, in Vancouver and British Columbia, in Montreal where I live as well. Certainly considering where the basis of power in Canada lie, Halifax as well I would, I would emphasize in terms of Atlantic Canada to very much the regional hub. Think about this from the perspective of where the organizations are that you would want to be in contact with. Now, Canada is not prone to offshoring. There is offshore work that's being done in Canada. There's more of it actually being done right now than ever before. But Canadian buyers tend not to be like the US. They tend not to be as enthusiastic about offshoring. But this is shifting given the fact that pricing and, and costs in Canada are more expensive than they've ever been. These have to be taken into account when positioning Jamaica as an offshore or a nearshore location in that regard. From the perspective of how you position services in Canada, traditionally, it's very price driven. 
Canadian enterprises tend to go with the players that can offer the best price points for them. I wouldn't say that it's not value driven. There's certainly an interest in value, but Canadian enterprises will tend to put more of an emphasis on the price point of the outsourcer positions than perhaps you would find in other more sophisticated or, or heavier demand markets for frontline services. And finally, vertical concentration. In Canada, you're going to find the bulk of the deals are in the telecommunication space and retail banking. Now, this is gradually shifting, but I would emphasize when you're coming into Canada, the advice that most people will give is the fact that most of the deals do lie in the telco, media, ISP, and the financial services, the retail financial services space. So certainly some elements to keep in mind there. Language considerations should not be underestimated either. Think about the fact in Canada, you're talking about a country where about one quarter of the population has French as their mother tongue. And if you're going to be going after deals that are going to be multi-regional or that are going to take into account Quebec, Eastern Ontario, New Brunswick, you need to have some type of a French solution. You need to have some type of a solution that will provide French language capacity. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have 100% people bilingual that are working on the telephones, but certainly having the occasion to source some French language capacity is going to be very important in order to make sure that your organization is going to be considered for RFPs that are going to be taking into account regions where French is spoken in large numbers. Now let's talk a little bit about the United States, which is obviously a very important element for winning deals in Jamaica. And again, apologies for the animation. I thought that this had been removed. Apparently it hasn't. One of the things about the United States, I would say from a frontline services perspective for any organization that's looking to try and win CX deals in the US, work at home has always been a big issue, but it's an even bigger one now. The United States effectively, I would say, pioneered the work at home model and enterprises are very interested in terms of being able to leverage a provider that's got not just the frontline talent, but the expertise and who understands the science of virtual delivery. So being able to demonstrate thought leadership in that regard is going to be very important. Equally, I would say there's a, a huge number of smaller local players in the United States that are gonna be competing for deals. Significantly more than you would find in Canada, there's a very robust mid market and smaller emerging market of outsourcers or services providers. So just keep that in mind in terms of the competition that you're likely to find as you come into the United States. And I also think it's important to recognize in the States, in the United States, there's much greater interest in terms of working with third parties more so than in Canada. So keep in mind the fact that you're likely to find a, a warmer reception as you go into American enterprise offices, as you meet the CX leaders in the United States, they're likely to be much more open to doing outsourcing or to doing third party service delivery than you would find north of the border in Canada. From the standpoint of regional buying, obviously very important too. What you'll find is that not just there's multiple commercial centers in the US, but there's a lot of organizations that are perhaps state-based or regionally based that will be buying services, particularly for one or two or three or four states, not necessarily big Pan-American deals, but certainly smaller, more regionally driven ones that can be a great entry point in terms of gaining a foothold in the United States as a demand market and being able to develop referenceability with an American client. And finally, cross vertical adoption of services. Think about the fact that in the United States, there is certainly a lot of work that's being done by telcos and media and ISPs, as well as retail banking, but there's also a lot going on in different sectors, what we would say more emerging sectors, industries such as the digitally driven ones, technology, we'd be looking at healthcare as well. And we'll talk a little bit about these, but remember to have a, a better idea going into the United States about perhaps not just looking at one or two different sectors, but understanding that the opportunity is across a significant number of them. Now I wanna talk as well from a language standpoint that the United States is not just an English or, or bust uh, approach. Think about the fact that in the USA right now, 60 million consumers speak Spanish as their mother tongue. That's a huge amount of people. That's more people than live in Poland. That's more people than live in South Africa. Think about the fact that in Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles, there's 5 million people who are Spanish, uh, who are Spanish mother tongue speakers. 
And I mean, that, that's just incredible. That's, that's bigger than the population of Denmark. So in order to be able to can be considered for the maximum number of RFPs that you might want to bid for in the USA, making sure that you've got a great Spanish language capability or access to Spanish language, either through your own capacity or with a partnership is going to be essential. If you don't, you're going to be shut out of a lot of potential deals and no services provider going into any new market wants to be shut out of anything. You want to have the maximum opportunity to win the maximum number of deals possible. In the United States, this means having some access to Spanish and being able to provide fluent Spanish in order to service this very important uh, U.S. Hispanic community, which I might add is the fastest growing single language demographic in the country and which has seen a significant rise in household incomes over the course of the past nearly 30 years. It's effectively double. And I actually recently wrote a blog on this just a few days ago. So if anybody wants to log on to ryanadvisory.com, check the industry commentary and you'll see a little bit more insight around this. Now let's talk a little bit about what some of the frontline services considerations that you might want to think about are in the North American context. And I think that as we go into this, there are a lot of different elements that you need to take into account. I spoke a little while ago about what it means for servicing different market segments. And I wanted to go into a little bit of a deep dive on this, especially talking a little bit in the initial point about industries. Now, I don't rate all industries the same in terms of where the opportunities lie. In my opinion, certain sectors are going to be more opportunistic than others. And those are the ones that any Jamaican services provider that's looking to try and gain a foothold in North America needs to consider, needs to take into its consideration in regards to what it wants to go after first. In an ideal world, we would all go after every market with the same level of enthusiasm, energy, and resource. But we understand in business, it's just not that simple. So my recommendation as you look at North America would be to prioritize the following six sectors. Born digital industries. Now the most logical examples of these would be Uber or Airbnb, but there's literally dozens, if not hundreds of these types of companies that are playing in the North American market right now. The individuals who found these companies and who run these companies are passionate about what they do. They're passionate about customer experience, but they're not passionate about delivering customer experience. And they are much more open by my experience to working with a third party than perhaps having their own operations in house. The technology space has been a proven sector in terms of the opportunity to try and drive new contact center or new service provision deals on a frontline basis. They tend to work with providers that are both domestic as well as ones that work in the near shore or the offshore, and they tend to like to diversify the services providers that they use. So certainly, again, technology firms, whether it's software, whether it's hardware, whether it's consumer technology, absolutely essential to go after for some great opportunities. There's no question e-commerce has taken off like uh, nobody would have ever believed over the course of the past six months. But let's not fool ourselves. This has been on a steady march forward and e-commerce organizations tend to understand more than most that good customer experience and good CX management is crucial in terms of driving the loyalty they need to have repeat business. So certainly going after e-commerce organizations, whether it's uh, the e-commerce division of a retailer or perhaps a, a pure e-commerce company on its own, very, very important in that regard. I've talked a little bit about regional banks and credit unions, and I, I use this um, example at the bottom with the home and the piggy bank. I'm not talking about large scale banks that would be working across Canada or that would be working across the USA. Rather, I'm talking about perhaps small networks of savings and loans or credit unions that are facing probably more customer experience pressure than they've ever had before and are desperately looking for a partner to help guide them, not just in terms of delivering the frontline service, but also in terms of providing with a blueprint in regards to where their customer service and their customer management strategy needs to go. Healthcare, I will say, is a very important one to consider too. Now, I will not say it'll be the easiest one for any organization that's not used to working in this space, but healthcare is definitely one. If you can tick all the compliance boxes, you'll find that healthcare clients uh, certainly would consider at least some of the, the more routine or transactional work uh, provider in the near shore, like Jamaica, 
as an opportunity for them. And I'd stress that that would be more on the American side where there's a much greater level of, of private involvement than in Canada, where it tends to be more focused around in-house captive employees. And finally, regional telcos and internet service providers. Certainly, you cannot underestimate the fact that the, there is a great deal of growth with deregulation. There are more smaller startup organizations that are setting themselves to, for success, but desperately need to move at least some of their capacity from a CX standpoint to a services provider to be able to provide them the assistance they need to generate great interactions and thereby generate loyalty. So there's six industries I would strongly recommend that every participant from Jamaica consider. And there's also some here that I will say will be challenges. Obviously, travel and tourism is, is really, I, I don't think, going to be uh, in any great shape for working with providers that can uh, handle large volumes of interactions anytime soon. Making sure that you've got a good travel and tourism strategy for when things return to some type of normal will be important, but don't expect any great opportunities for the time being. Higher end financial services will tend to keep, whether it's brokerage or insurance, they tend to try and keep a, a lot of this type of, of work in house. If they do outsource, it tends to be with larger organizations that have a great deal of experience and that are compliant in regards to the regulation. Not to say that you shouldn't go after these, but just recognize this will be a long play as opposed to perhaps one of the more opportunistic ones. National retail banks I don't recommend in North America. They tend to be very aggressive on price. They tend to be very tough in terms of profitability. They are volume plays. They're not necessarily ones that you can expect a great deal of margin on. And the same goes for large telcos. Now, one of the things I keep hearing from organizations when we talk about vertical opportunities in the US or Canada, the first thing they'll say is avoid the telco space. You will not make any money. And this is not a, an approach that any new services provider looking at North America wants to consider. The government's not going to do any work with an outsourcer in the offshore and nearshore. This is just not realistic. And there's no point, at least in the near to medium term, looking to try and win business from Canadian governments, whichever it may be at the provincial or federal level or municipal. And the same goes in the US state level, national or municipal. It's not worth your while. It's not worth the stress and the aggravation. And neither are utilities. Utilities have been deregulated, but there's still a great, great influence, uh, especially amongst the unions and keeping this work in house. Uh, I would stress that while perhaps there might be some niche deals out there, it's best to try and focus on the verticals we've talked about in the previous slide, as opposed to utilities or the other five, if you're looking to try and enter the US or Canadian markets anytime soon. I want to talk a little bit about the situation when it comes to investment capacity in the US and Canada. One of the things that Ryan Strategic Advisory does each year is we run a buyer survey, an enterprise survey, where we talk to CX decision makers within different organizations across different sectors. And I broke out the results for the US and Canada in order to try and find out a little bit about what the buying community, what the CX buying community was saying in terms of their own budgets. And what we can see here is the number of organizations or the proportion of organizations in both the states and Canada that indicate that they are likely going to see their CRM or their contact center or their CX budgets stay flat or decrease over the course of 2021 is quite pronounced. Now, what this means is that when you take a look across most of the revenue bands, smaller organizations from 10 to 250 million in revenue, all the way through to medium sized firms, 250 million to $1 billion, or large scale firms, 1 billion plus, you can see that most of these are going to be facing quite a crunch. And with that in mind, going after these CX decision makers and talking to them about what you can deliver in terms of taking some of the pressure off their budgets by providing them with the people, the processes and the technology in order to help generate loyalty on the back of great interactions that are delivered from Jamaica. There'll certainly be, I think, a very great resonance in terms of this buying community that are significantly under strain where they're seeing their budgets that have been slashed probably over the course of 2021 with the course of the pandemic and how it's gone and are very likely to see this continue as a trend over the course of the coming year and perhaps going in further. So definitely being able to position the added value you can drive in the face of their captive constrained budgets is a great, great strategy in that regard.
Some of the pain points that Canadian contact centers, Canadian captive contact centers are looking for, we'll take a look at what some of the top ones are. Agent attrition, finding the right agents. Agent management is definitely something that Canadian captives are facing as one of the biggest obstacles in terms of generating great interactions. Managing CX across different channels. It's no longer just a voice game as we all know. You've got to have email, you've got to have chat, you've got to have social media, you've got to have messaging, you've got to be able to support a, across different automated platforms. So being able to help an organization, being able to help a buyer in Canada with those multi-channel elements is so, so important as well as many of the other ones that you'll see here, including data protection and integrating different elements of automation into the delivery of fine customer experience. The US, we see a lot of similar elements, but what I would say here too is keep in mind that in the United States, buyers seem to be uh, quite frankly plagued with uh, pain points as it relates to ensuring good data protection and making sure that information security is going to be kept in the utmost of, of sanctity. Equally, the, the channel management we see in the United States certainly plays out, as do the supporting the changes that might be popping up with regards to the products and the services that these organizations are supporting from a captive operation. So all these elements combined, I think, indicate that certainly while captives are doing their best in the USA, there's a lot of elements that they do need to try and overcome in order to be better, which is going to be much more difficult when they've got constrained budgets so they don't have the money to invest in the technologies or into refining the processes or into finding the best people and keeping those best people. This is something that an outsourcer in Jamaica is in a great position to help these organizations in the United States or Canada with. So competitive positioning for the outsourcing community in North America. Certainly, I think that this has evolved a lot over the course of my career. As, as I can think back to the amount of time I've been working in the contact center or the CX community within the scope of North America, there's been some significant changes. And definitely, I think we're going to see a lot of these changes that are going to be highlighted in regards to what we're going to be talking about over the course of the next few slides. But what I'd like to do here is go back to some survey data that we collected from Ryan Strategic Advisory. One of the questions that we asked the respondents, these decision makers who are based all over the world, and what I've done is I've broken out results for Canada and the United States, but we asked what these buyers, potential buyers of services, frontline services saw that, an, that a BPO or a service provider had to have in order to win their business. Well, we can see in Canada, certainly being able to manage compliance and information security are, are two very, very important elements in the top three. And this should come as no surprise. How many times over the course of the past few years have we heard about hacks into databases with personal information stolen? It's become an epidemic, unfortunately. And being able to work with an outsourcer that has experience in terms of managing the regulation around security and information security and be able to lock that information down in as tight and secure an operation as possible is so important. But equally in Canada, it's also important to be able to demonstrate referenceability. And you'll remember when I talked about the nuances as it related to Canada, we certainly understand that from the perspective of Canadian buyers, they like to work with a provider, a services provider that's got a great track record and a great level of, of authority in the marketplace. And that counts with referenceability. Being able to show solid client references, being able to show that a solid track record is there will certainly do well for any Jamaican organization that's looking to come and try and work in the Canadian context. In the United States, we see, uh, uh, frankly, a lot of similarities, but we do see some differences in terms of what the main priorities are for working with a service provider or finding a service provider. Obviously, data protection provisions and experience providing information security, very important. But equally, I would say that managing home-based agents is a definite advantage and something that every Jamaican organization looking to play in the U.S. should consider their own track record, what they've done, and how best to promote any experience or any success stories that they might have in the United States in that regard. And equally, being able to emphasize expertise, subject matter expertise, in customer care delivery. 
that is essential and it should be something that everybody considers to be a priority on this call as they look to try and move into the US. And the referenceability certainly plays out a lot, I think, too. Being able to demonstrate a great track record to be able to hold up case studies about work that you might have done with a client, perhaps an American client or perhaps a client that might be based elsewhere, but certainly demonstrating that you've got experience, you've got expertise, and you've got a track record of driving great interactions will go over quite well in the USA. So to sum these up, to sum up some of the client acquisition strategy elements that you might want to take into account. Obviously, some commonalities we see across the North American market is that compliance and information security certainly count for a lot. Multi-channel capabilities also are very important. The recognition, as I said, that it's no longer a voice or bust game. Right now, it's all about digital interactions and making sure that you've got the right channels in place to service clients in the US and Canada who are desperately looking to try and accommodate their consumers that are wanting to interact with them across a whole plethora of different channels. Making sure that you've got some advanced technologies in place and that you've got the expertise, whether it's analytics, whether it's AI, whether it's automation, these are definitely services that enterprises are interested in procuring. They're definitely services that they want to try and bring into their own CX strategies, but they're not necessarily ones that they want to take on themselves or that they want to hire people for, they'd much rather work with the services provider. So being able to demonstrate that thought leadership and that understanding will be essential, as well as having those services ready to go. Being able to talk about what you've done, how you've accomplished service level excellence for different clients, and talking about that, promoting that is going to be very, very important. Tooting your own horn, I think, is, is, is crucial in terms of what the buying community is looking for. And being able to demonstrate that you understand what's going on from a CX standpoint in the US and Canada, not North America, but individually to each country is gonna be important too. Demonstrating broad generic understanding of CX and CX level uh, elements uh, is, is fine, but being able to be able to take that into the context of your buying demand market, whether it's Canada or the USA will be crucial in terms of standing out and distinguishing yourself as a services provider in both of these countries. And also expertise in different work models. The, the reality is work at home is here. It's not going away. It's only going to become more important. Gig working is also becoming more important. So being able to perhaps bone up on these to uh, demonstrate an understanding and being able to provide some of these solutions in the North American context will be very important. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Jamaica's dynamic from a services standpoint in the US and Canada. Excuse me while I take a drink. Now, what I've done is I've broken out some survey data here from the standpoint of the US and Canada as it relates to offshore and nearshore location favorability. In the 2020 front office BPO omnibus survey, we asked the respondents across the demand markets and again broken out the North American results here on two different slides their level of favorability towards uh, roughly 50 different countries. And what we can see is that Jamaica actually rates very highly in Canada. In fact, it's roughly in the top 10. It's uh, only behind a few other countries. If we see that uh, Jamaica has uh, been eclipsed by, I, I believe it's just uh, Haiti is the only country in the Caribbean that did better than Jamaica. And I put that down to the fact that uh, Haiti has got a great deal of resonance, especially amongst the bilingual or the French language community in Canada, but Jamaica exceeded the interest in countries like Egypt, Guyana, Cote d'Ivoire, Colombia, Guatemala, the Dominican Republic. It's certainly playing from a position of strength when it, we're talking about the nearshore and nearshore locations that Canadian enterprises would be interested in perhaps working in from a services or a CX standpoint. And the story is still pretty good in the United States. Take a look from the standpoint of Jamaica in regards to where it sits relative to other offshore and nearshore locations in the United States. And we can see that certainly it's done very well. It's uh, only in behind a few different countries from the near shore. It's in a much better position than most near shore location. And it's amongst the highest from the Caribbean portion of the near shore. In fact, I believe it's only, um, it's only Puerto Rico that uh, pipped Jamaica at the post in this context. So certainly in the US and Canada, Jamaica is seen from a position of strength when it comes to customer experience delivery. 
And I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that Jamaica has got a great reputation in terms of its local services providers, as well as some of the global ones that have moved in over the past decade or so and done exceptionally well in terms of providing high levels of interactions to consumers in both the US and Canada. So I thought what we do now is we talk a little bit about what some of the different elements are in regards to Jamaican, some of the perceptions of Jamaican frontline service delivery by buyers in the US and Canada. Well, I think it's seen as a very accessible country. It's a country that's not difficult to get to and that's gonna be important from the standpoint going forward as I just don't believe that buyers in the US and Canada are gonna to wanna to spend huge amounts of time flying to Africa or to Asia like they used to. It's an established location that's got a proven track record and that goes over very well in both the US and Canada. The fact that you can get great value and great quality interactions from Jamaica, I think that that goes without saying. It's a no brainer. It's an understanding that you can do transactional work in Jamaica, but you can also do that value add work that brings more margin into your, into your services operation. It's got a great stable delivery climate. Jamaica is not a location where I think there's a lot of concern about disruption, whether it's economic, political, or, or socio. We don't necessarily see Jamaica as a spot where people bring those worries up. It's got a government that's been demonstrated, I think, that it's pro-business, it's pro-commerce, and it's also very pro-services sector. And I've had the chance to meet the Prime Minister in Jamaica at a services-related event, and certainly he spoke very, very passionately about his vision for developing this industry in the country. And I think that that's a great, great asset that you've got on your side. That you can deliver from several different points in Jamaica, I think is important too. The fact that you've got Montego Bay, and I know many, many people from Montego Bay are on the line right now, as are from Kingston, but also other communities are demonstrating that you can be disruptive and you can deliver CX frontline services from these communities. So, so important. The domestic industry and the fact that you've got so many entrepreneurs that are on the line today, as well as ones that are demonstrating the value that they can bring to the marketplace, also I think is a great advantage in terms of demonstrating the dynamism that you can find in Jamaica on the ground. Now, some of the concerns that you do hear mentioned around Jamaica, the fact that there's a view that it doesn't necessarily have the same scalability that other locations would have. It is smaller than many other countries in the near shore or the offshore that there is concern about weather related issues specifically. Uh, we do hear that a lot and, and what that means in regards to disrupting service delivery over the course of a campaign. Jamaica is seen as a great English language location, no question about it, but it's not necessarily associated with secondary languages, French or Spanish, which we talked about are both so important in the North American context that perhaps it's a little bit more expensive than what you'd find in Asia or certain African countries as well. It's seen as a pricier option, a higher value option, but certainly one that perhaps is more expensive. And that might be off-putting for some, for some clients that are looking at a variety of different spots around the world. You do hear concerns about crime, that, that uh, Jamaica is perhaps not as safe a location to visit or to do business in as other locations. I'd stress it as a perception. I've been to Jamaica many, many times and had no issues. I've always been welcomed with the height of courtesy. Nobody's ever given me any trouble. And I think that that's been the majority of the cases, overwhelming majority, but there is a perception for people who don't know the country that it perhaps might not be safe from a petty crime standpoint. And it's one of many options in the Caribbean. When you talk about the Caribbean, there are many countries from which to choose. And how best to make Jamaica stand out? That's going to be a challenge when you've got more options that are popping onto the board. So just to wrap up, and, and again, thanks to everybody for their patience and for their interest. It's been great being able to, to give some of my thoughts in regards to the experience I've had with the buyers in North America and as, as it relates to my friends in Jamaica. Obviously, Canadian U.S. buyers are very distinct. Each country has their own pain points and their own drivers in terms of CX. And I think that Jamaican providers who are on the, the line today need to consider the fact that these two countries are distinct when they're fashioning their marketing and their business development strategies. Making sure that for North America in general, having a good mix of transactional and high value functions is going to be important to come out with a very broad services portfolio to satisfy what clients in both countries need. 
And I also think that understanding the right sectors, and we talked about the, the ones that are more opportunistic versus the ones that perhaps aren't necessarily as attractive, are important to understanding where you need to go first in regards to what organizations you want to target for your services provision. The, I think in terms of the pain points, understanding what the pain points are in regards to customer experience management uh, are very important too. And being able to tailor your strategy and tailor what you have to offer with regards to some of the, the challenges that organizations are feeling right now in the US and Canada from a CX perspective. Obviously, Jamaica plays from a position of strength relative to the US and the Canadian marketplace is certainly uh, seen as a very high value location. And that was reflected in the survey data that we brought out. So something to keep in mind that you are, uh, you are going in from a position of strength and being able to focus on those positions of strength, those elements of strength as it relates to service delivery from Jamaica will do you a lot of good. Me able to prioritize what is seen as important in Jamaica from a perspective of what you do well, but also confronting misconceptions of which there are some and we've gone over and being able to effectively exercise those misconceptions and getting in front of them before that becomes an issue when a potential client is looking at a Jamaican services provider versus one from another country. Uh, being able to make sure that they don't have those misperceptions in place will be crucial in terms of being able to win business. So, with that in mind, I will leave it open to any questions, probably towards the end, but I'll stop sharing my screen. And again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Ryan. So as he mentioned, the Q&A is open for questions. I'd now like to introduce our second panelist for the afternoon, Ms. Kayleen Eccles. She is the Chief Operations Officer at eTech Global Services, which is one of our leading members of the CX environment. Ms. Eccles boasts over 20 years experience in the contact center industry. During her tenure at eTech, she has served several leadership positions, including Director of Operations, AVP, AVP of Global Operations, and Vice President of Global Operations, and since February of 2017, has served as their COO, with competencies in quality assurance, strategic planning, operations management, and training with a focus on contact center operations. Ms. Eccles, under her leadership, has continued to raise the bar and deliver on stakeholder and customer commitments, delivering consistent year-over-year -year growth at eTech. She's passionate about leadership and living eTech's vision, which is to make a remarkable difference for each other, our customers, and within our communities. And in 2019, she was recognized for her leadership, earning a Silver Stevie Award for Woman of the Year in Customer Service. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our second panelist, Ms. Kayleen Eccles. Thank you, Kaylee. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I want to thank <clears throat> Gloria and the GSAJ and our, our talented uh, presenters today, uh, experts Peter and Jackie, and all of you for having us here with you. So just a, a little bit about eTech. Who is eTech? Uh, we began our journey in 2003 with just one center in Nacogdoches, Texas, where I'm joining you from today. And uh, over the, these past many years, we've grown to eight sites plus one client site, actually, 3,000 team members, uh, no mergers, acquisitions, and we're proud to, to serve our customers as, as trusted advisors um, to these Fortune 50 companies. Uh, we have three divisions at eTech, our traditional contact center solutions, which you may be familiar with. Um, also, eTech Insights, which uh, is led by Jim Ayub, our Chief Customer Officer. Many of you may know Jim, and I, I think he's with us today. And uh, eTech Insights serves our internal teams, but also their clients and provides insights, data insights, uh, to help customers make better decisions about their business. And um, also completing our tech stack is our eTech Technology Solutions, which um, is our talented team of software developers and uh, data scientists um, that work with our reporting and workforce management teams. And uh, we're just, we're so proud to uh, be a minority owned business and I'm thrilled to be here with you today. So when, when Gloria first talked to me about today's session, I was thinking about this moment 
in history, where we're at right now. And sometimes I, I have to pinch myself because I can't really um, still believe where we are where we are today. A lot of words that start with C come to mind, like COVID and crisis, challenge, cure, contact tracing, which I hadn't thought too much about up until now, uh, cure and, and community. And uh, as business and community leaders, our teams and, and citizens are looking to each of us in this moment to really guide them and to reassure them and, and to help provide solutions. As we navigate these uncharted waters together, my hope is that today I can share a few things with you um, that may be of value to you and your teams and your companies and uh, encourage you to see that there are opportunities out there for us to seize. And uh, I believe each of us has literally been preparing for this moment our entire lives. We didn't know it, but we've been preparing for this moment. And I believe um, that great things are, are going to happen as a result. So let's talk about some other words that start with C that can, can help us through this challenging time. And uh, those are up on, on your screen right there. Clarity, communicate, create, creative or creativity, connect, and care. So the first one being clarity, and I have our priorities up uh, in front of you. <clears throat> We've probably all spent countless hours making sure that our teams, just business as usual, know what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. I know we have at eTech. Uh, that's just business as usual for us. And then you know, 2020 happens and bam, right? It was early Q, Q1 and you're probably watching the news like me and you're seeing um, reports about uh, COVID and um, it, it was almost like a wave, watching a wave come at you and just really not knowing what the full impact of it would be. But we knew that this was something different. Something, something different was happening and we needed to respond in a different way. And I have to say, I'm really grateful for the leadership of our president and CEO, Matt Rocco, because he quickly stepped in and he established four key priorities for our business. And um, with so much uncertainty in the world, uh, we knew that we had to be really clear about what, as a company, that we needed to do and how would we guide our decisions. So he created this video message. It went out to our entire team and um, we quickly worked then to cascade that over and over and over again. So everybody knew what our priorities were in this moment. Since March, these priorities, they've had a seat literally at the table with us as we make every decision we're asking ourselves is this in the best interest and safety of our team their families does it protect the livelihoods of our team and are we being there for our customers and their customers in this moment and again these priorities would be unique to your business but i would just say that clarity is one of the most important things that we can do for our teams in this moment the next c that uh, came to mind was communicate. And uh, I love this quote by John Gordon. He's an author, if you don't know, he, he has written some great books, one of them, The Energy Bus. And he said, communication builds trust. Trust generates commitment. Commitment fosters teamwork. And teamwork delivers results. And isn't that why we're all here? Um, it's because someone trusts us to deliver results for them. COVID isn't, it, it isn't a secret. Crisis is not a secret. People have been bracing themselves, trying to figure out what's next, what's gonna happen next, what do, we, what do we need to do? And that's why it's so important for us to make sure that we're communicating. Um, in the absence of 
consistent and clear communication, negativity will fill that void. Misinformation will fill that void. You know how the rumor mill works within your companies. And so clarity is so important and, and communication, I would say is number two uh, of importance. We knew that we had to be intentional in our communication. Um, truth can be hard. Uh, it can be uncomfortable, but it's easy to remember and it's easy to be consistent with and it's easy to engage then other people to help help us with um, creating solutions and um, so i just encourage you to communicate and not just with your team um, but with your customers and have that open dialogue with them your stakeholders up the line down the line now more than ever communication is is critical for people they need to know The next C I thought of um, was creativity and being creative. At eTech, we talk about reinventing continuously. It's one of, it's one of our favorite things, one, it's something that really drives and motivates a lot of our team. And boy, is this an opportunity for all of us to be creative thinkers. Uh, I love this John Maxwell quote. He says, we don't see these incredible opportunities first because every opportunity that you and I have is surrounded by a problem. I've never gone to an opportunity that I didn't have to go to the door of problems first. So we have a problem, uh, but it's also an opportunity. And, and uh, Peter talked about many of those opportunities that are out there um, for us right now. It's also true, nothing clarifies your thinking like an imminent threat. And there was a threat. There's a, a threat for you and your safety and your family's safety and your businesses. And <clears throat> I'm not sure <laughs> about you and how your, your rollouts normally work um, within your companies, but at eTech, I, I can tell you that um, our teams and our customers have really rallied. And under the best circumstances, a rollout may, may take weeks or months. And we're talking about days. We took, we have 3,000 team members and we, in a matter of a couple of weeks, we had moved 90% of them to a work from home status back in March. It's just incredible. I've never seen anything like it, um, but the team has really been energized and, and been creative around it. Just in Montego Bay, uh, we've had an incredible opportunity to pursue work from home, which is something new for us there. We've not done work from home in the past there and the team has just done a phenomenal job um, and it's it's led to many benefits for us improved employee satisfaction better schedule adherence and attendance and better performance quite frankly and they've actually launched a new customer in this moment during covid and tripled the size of that customer the customer had a problem and our teams collectively at eTech delivered a solution and our Montego Bay team members were part of that great solution for this customer. They needed some geo diversity. They couldn't have all of their eggs in one basket, so to speak. And, and so this has been a really a great opportunity for us. Nobody wants a global pandemic. No, none of us planned for anything like this or maybe even thought that something like this could occur, but it's been an opportunity to deliver solutions for our team to protect them and for our customers as well. And, and I believe that this is something um, <clears throat> we're not going back. We're, we're not going back to normal. There will be no normal after this. We're continuing to reinvent ourselves and become stronger because of it. Another C that comes to mind is, is connect. And as humans, connection is, is so important. Um, if you're like us and you, ha you have large portions of your team working remotely right now, finding ways to connect virtually and uh, securely is, is critical. Um, people need to, to know what they do matters. We all need to, to have that connection with, with someone and understand how do I contribute to the big picture? How am I doing? Does anyone notice? Is anyone listening? Is anyone watching? Uh, 
is my is my work valued? Is it appreciated? Um, is 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 this it for me, or do I have an opportunity right now? We all need that that value and to feel that value. And so I just want to encourage everyone to make sure that you're connecting with your team and with your customers and um, with your stakeholders, everyone really in this moment to connect them uh, to this bigger picture. We've done virtual award ceremonies. We've done, our team is just amazing, coming up with just creative ideas. We've done drive-through incentive pickups, like touchless delivery. Can you imagine driving through with your car and getting your incentive placed in, to the back seat of your car, which just really creative ideas. And, and I know that there's more creative ideas on the way from our team, but just a way to connect and, and make sure that people know that you appreciate them and, and, and thank them for what they're doing and, and that it matters. So connection is key. So the last C I was thinking about <clears throat> is care. COVID has brought so many changes um, quickly, right, <laughs> for all of us. And how many of you feel like the picture to the left describes, you know, how how you felt at the beginning of this moment i was talking with some people the other day and they're like there were parachutes that you had parachutes i felt like i was jumping out of a plane without a parachute is is how it felt because it was such uncharted territory um and it was so widespread the impact truly was global we truly are in this all together there's not a corner of the earth really that's not been impacted by this. And so, um, although the left may be how we felt uh, initially, I think using these five C's, it's more like on the right side, there's someone there. We're the people that are there for our team to guide them and support them. Uh, <clears throat> this moment is like no other. I, I don't wanna diminish it, diminish it, um we definitely need to demonstrate care people are are anxious right now there's stress and pressure outside of of what we see we we may not see it right um lifestyles have changed people that are really outgoing people are are cooped up and they're they're lacking that social interaction that energy that feeds them um people are worried about the health and safety of their families. People have lost loved ones right now in this moment. And that's why care is so important. We have struggling with, you know, people that are working from home, maybe they're not working from the office, socially distant, maybe they are working from home to, to be safe and secure. And they're working next to, you know, three of their family members or their, I was, on the phone the other day with one of our customers and she's like i i can only talk to you after five because during the day i'm uh my child's in kindergarten and they're online learning can you imagine i bet you can imagine because you're probably doing this too you're in this moment and you're having these same struggles and so i just i just know how important it is to make sure that we're there for each other and that we're caring for each other and people know um, that we're here to support them and care for them. I believed you specifically have prepared your whole life for this moment. You may not think that you've been preparing for this moment, but you have prepared for this moment. And with clarity, communication, creativity, connection, and care, I'm confident that you are a solution for this moment. And uh, you're the one who can seize the opportunity. Lead your teams, your customers, your, your shareholders, your communities into a brighter tomorrow. And so I have no doubt that you will do just that. If you, if you need some support on our uh, website, etechgs.com, we have many blogs from some of our um, best leaders in our company who have written blogs about how to manage through COVID, also how to manage your business and seize opportunities in this moment, leverage insights. And so I just encourage you to reach out. It's a free resource, etechgs.com. And uh, 
thank you all so much for having me here today. God bless. Thank you so much, Ms. Eccles. Um, for those of you who have asked questions in our Q&A, in the interest of time, we're having the presenters answer those questions and type them so that everyone can see. So please direct your attention to the Q&A if you ask the question to see the answer. Now we would like to introduce our third and final presenter for the evening, or afternoon, sorry, and that is Ms. Jacqueline Sutherland. Ms. Sutherland founded Context 360 BPO Solutions in 2007, which has grown significantly and is considered one of the largest locally owned and operated BPOs in the Caribbean and Latin American markets. Ms. Sutherland, a native of Jamaica, has over 25 years experience in information technology and the application of contact center solutions and has applied her expertise in people and business management to lead the development of Contact 360. Prior to entering the BPO space, Ms. Sutherland had an extensive background in technology, holding various levels of positions in Fortune 500 top companies, including Verizon, Bankrate, and NASA. Her executive experience, along with an education in math, computer science, and telecommunications management, provided a solid base for establishing a world-class business process outsourcing operation right here in Jamaica, with operations in the Montego Bay Free Zone. The company provides customer service, collections, telesales, tech support, chat, and back office services primarily to North American clients with services offered in the financial, travel and leisure, telecommunications, medical services, and statistical analysis industry. The company is also actively involved with the Jamaican government's efforts to build the ICT sector and position Jamaica as a destination for clients requiring nearshore solutions. To this end, Contact360 has partnered with international call center giants and helped to bring an array of prestigious clients anxious to tap into Jamaica's nearshore human talent. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, Ms. Jacqueline Sutherland. Um, Jackie, I think you need to unmute your microphone. Thank you, Gloria. Let's try that again. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Um, as I was saying, um, Gloria had asked me to just talk fluidly about my experience in uh, the BPO sector. We've been here now for about 13 years and uh, we've had our challenges. Um, it's been a uh, a tremendous opportunity to uh, support the BPO sector in Jamaica and uh, during our tenure uh, in Jamaica we've seen Jamaica make some tremendous strides so glad to be here and part of this discussion and um, further the conversations about what uh, strategies we've employed to help uh, steer the ship on the right path as we, as we go through this pandemic together. Um, I was a perpetual student before uh, getting into my career. And when I made the decision to come to Jamaica and start a call center, I felt that the experiences that I had gained in America would well position me for um, providing, initially my thought was to provide IT outsourced services to Jamaica, but based on the trajectory for Jamaica at the time, traditional contact center services made a lot more sense and my background in technology coupled with the emphasis on customer service was a good marriage between what was becoming a growing and flourishing BPO sector for Jamaica and being able to um, provide the appropriate infrastructure to support those needs. So um, my while my initial vision might have been one thing, uh, as, as they say in Jamaica, I decided to wheel and come again and um, pursue not the technology aspects, but more of the customer facing um, opportunities for the clients that we serviced. So um, being in this industry and being in this industry for 13 years uh, did not come without its challenges. So we're not new to uh, challenges. Some of the things that we had to do in launching the business at that time was to work with the country to help overcome many of the misconceptions 
um, on outsourcing and help them to understand the value add that the BPO sector could offer to Jamaica. In addition to that, there are many financial obstacles because I don't think people really understood what the BPO sector meant at that time. Now, mind you, this was 13 years ago, so the dynamics have certainly changed. Um, real estate was not the easiest to come by. And for Jamaicans, we were overcoming a lot of the training and educational challenges to make sure that we were able to provide first world interactions. Um, having um, been in it now, I can, I can safely say that we've made tremendous strides and, and we're definitely a force to be reckoned with in the overall um, out processing sector. Um, through perseverance and the support of the Montego Bay Free Zone and JAMPRO, they had a, a team at the time that was very, very supportive and trying to really learn the business as we were growing. We were able to launch our first client with just five agents. We grew to a staff complement of over 850 staff and we just continued to grow providing diabetic supply services. We were very instrumental in partnering with a U.S. company to bring one of the largest telco companies to, um, in North America to Jamaica. And um, Jamaica then became one of the approved destinations for this company. We became the online chat center of excellence, providing technical support for several large clients in North America, and just continue to um, grow in the BPO space. We had a strategic partnership with one of the largest BPO providers out of Canada, who based on the growth of the industry in Jamaica has also proudly taken up residence and they're our neighbors. So um, we've seen a lot of growth and, um, are very, and proudly watched the Jamaicans and all of my colleagues excel in this space. So while I thought I was a graduate of the lessons of lessons learned, nothing truly prepared any of us for a pandemic such as the one that we now face. Um, I think this has really grounded us. And from what I've observed, it's made us stronger. And I, and, and I, um, I mean, none of us want to go through this, but it's certainly um, shown the strength of our people and how we are able to um, be very fluid and and make changes very rapidly. So um, in, in preparing for the challenges that we were all gonna be faced with, um, I was reminded that resilience is key. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of the entire sector when I say that the fluidity and much, much, much support that we got from the government, the free zone and the GSA, um, through that we've been able to persevere and in many cases thrive. I think Jamaica continues to be recognized as a preferred nearshore provider of contact center services and one that has managed the storm extremely well. You know, we've all had our, our hiccups, but I think as a, as a country and as companies collectively, we've done extremely well in, in managing and weathering these storms. Um, there still remains a great vision for Jamaica and future for the sector's growth and expansion and opportunities that will be that will continue to afford us growth um, from a value chain perspective as well. So when I was asked, um, you know, what challenges we faced and how we overcame them, um, we did what we had to do and I think we, we executed it well. And I think we all worked together as a team to make it happen. And I think we did this to ensure that um, we were able to provide seamless services to the clients that we support, not just mine, but I know all of my colleagues on this phone as well. Uh, we all were very passionate about working together through this um, pandemic to make sure that uh, we didn't have um, a lot of hiccups. So as a company, I think some of the things that we immediately had to do is to review, revise, look at our um, standard operating procedures and look at what we needed to do to ensure, first and foremost, the safety of our staff and the welfare of them. Um, we work very closely with um, the BPIJ to ensure that uh, compliance was adhered to. Uh, some of the, the basic things, mass sanitization, temperature checks, making changes to the overall spacing and infrastructures at our centers were adhered to, um, enforcing appropriate social distancing, and, and doing some collaborations with our clients to make sure that as curfews were introduced and and hours were adjusted that we were able to support their needs, but also make sure that uh, on our end, our, our staff were, were being managed and cared for as well. Um, I know that ETEC uh, 
managed to outsource most of their agent to work at home mode. And I think all of us had to quickly um, explore and implement technology to be able to afford that. We, at our peak, had outsourced, I believe, about 60 to 70% of our workforce to a work at home mode. And we continue to um, have that in play just for the safety of the staff. And we, um, you know, to make sure that we are servicing the clients as best we can as well. Um, some of the things in deploying the work at home agents that we had to look at was really not only enhancing our technology, but revisiting the productivity management, time management, realigning our expectations with our staff and making sure that in doing all of these, there was no compromise to the quality of the services that we were providing. And as we looked at it, uh, we found that some of the strategies that we had engaged from a training perspective had to be revisited. Um, skills in measuring and ensuring success with distance learning is very different from in-class training. And so we had to really look at ways to measure success and what it looked like for us and our staff. Uh, we had to retrain some of the agents that were already working with us and preparing them for working at home. In some cases, the skill sets needed to be reevaluated and um, we needed to place a stronger emphasis on um, training the staff on self-discipline. So a lot of things happened in a very short space of time for us to be able to immediately manage what was happening and the transitions that were occurring as part of the overall transition. And um, as we look towards growing the business, as most companies are doing now, it's a little different from what we're accustomed to. So, you know, our marketing strategies have had to be revisited. I know there's a concept that we've always had, and I know some companies open up thinking that if we build it, they will come. Um, well, now it's more pronounced than ever, that it's not exactly how it works. Um, you have to know your audience, as Peter had mentioned earlier. And one of the things that we've had to do is revisit our overall marketing strategy and look at our and, and learn how to market our strengths as a company and a country in a more uh, virtual way. So it, it, it's, been a, it's been a good opportunity for us to re-examine what our strengths are and uh, I think some of the things that we were projecting as a company are very timely with Jamaica's plan to scale the value chain, as Gloria had mentioned earlier. And I think in looking at the technologies that we've employed, things that are happening with uh, digital services and the technology space, managed security services, because security is such a large um, component now with what everyone is doing with um, trying to service our clients in this new normal. Um, it, it's very timely and um, we're looking to market that in a very new and unique way um, and tapping into our expertise and our core competencies. So we've had to take a step back. And um, while we had Park Technology when I first launched the company some 13 years ago, um, the advances in technology and the digital services that we are now um, seeing at the forefront of Jamaica's future um, are now coming back. So you know, old time something come back again and here we are. So um, there's lots of possibilities in the future expansion into ITO, finance and accounting, legal process outsourcing are all very real and strong potentials for the things that um, can and should do and should be looking into as we move forward. So. Um, there's a there's a great great future for Jamaica and many different fronts and it's something that I hope that we're all at the forefront of. Um, it's time some of the things that we're doing as part of our strategy is realigning our network of resources, um, revisiting this new normal. Now we're looking at ways to connect with our, our contacts more virtually than we ever have before. But uh, as we're doing that, so are they. So looking at new opportunities on their end means opportunities for us as well. So we're just being very very diligent about continuing to um, pursue these opportunities, you know, with, with the existing network that we have. Um, we're taking advantage of many of the certifications that we have as a company to pursue um, some opportunities that might not otherwise avail themselves to us. So we've had to really look at different ways um, 
to train, to market, and to prepare our staff for the for the near future and what we now anticipate will be for many months to come. So um, a lot of changes, a lot of things have been happening, but I, I as much as the pandemic has um, been very painful for all of us, I think it's really, it's, it's, ta it's taught us a lot and it, it's brought us back to um, where we need to be and, and, and um, revisiting things as a company and how we should be targeting things as well. Um, it's been a monumental swing for us all, but it's time for us to reevaluate, recharge, and implement best practices and streamline processes to further help us stand out as both a destination and a company of cho choice. So I, that's all I had, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present Contacts 360. Okay, thank you so much, Jacqueline. Uh, before we wrap up, we had some questions here. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask one per panelist. So Jacqueline, for you, from your experience as a contact center operator, do you believe in light of work from home that physical spaces may become obsolete? Um, I believe there's still a lot of value to having um, some staff work at home, but there is definitely an opportunity to um, expand our work from home opportunities and provide um, more flexibility for the staffing that we can afford to our, to our clients by taking advantage of work at home. Okay, okay thank you. Um, for Mr. Ryan, we have a question in the chat. Uh, would you say there is a difference in clients' acquisition for contact centers compared to software outsourcing? It's, it's funny because I was actually just typing an answer to it, so you must have read my mind. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, I definitely think that there is a difference. You know, if you're looking at software and sourcing a, a company that might be able to assist in that regard, I, I fully suspect that there'll be criterions that will be driven heavily by the skills of the software developers, uh, driven uh, heavily by the particular elements of competence. Uh, as we know, software has got many different facets to it. So certainly experience a strong track record uh, devising solutions in those regards. Well, I think contact center uh, functionality is gonna be quite, quite important too, and a, a great track record of demonstrating the capacity to deliver fantastic interactions. There is also going to be elements that will be focused around price point, uh, the location of where the contact center is going to be in terms of accessibility and the profile of the agents that the contact center in question would be uh, perhaps um, more associated with and, and a track record of recruiting of certain types of agents. So yeah, I, I think that uh, the drivers would be very, very different for both software and contact center. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ryan. No and finally, for Ms. Eccles, Ms. Eccles, as an expert in quality assurance and noting that it's a key competency for BPO companies, how exactly do you think the work from home dynamic that we're currently faced with, with sorry, would impact that? Ooh, Kaylee, that's a great question. I'm so glad that you asked that because um, this is something we're super passionate about at eTech and um, we have Actually, our eTech Insights team and our operations teams and technology teams have all been partnering together to um, launch uh, rem remote coaching. And so what we do today is side by side, right? We get in and we hunker down next to our team members and we coach them. And I think Jackie is saying yes, because she knows, right? This is, that's just what we do. We're high energy people. But um, now we have talent globally that we're leveraging. So we could have someone in Jamaica coaching someone in the US, coaching someone who is across the world in India or the Philippines. And um, so technology is definitely gonna play into this, but quality will be more important than ever. Peter mentioned about security and we need to make sure that we have security at the forefront in our work from home solutions and uh, quality will be no different. We have to have that at the forefront. People need to be coached, they need feedback, and uh, we'll need technology solutions um, like we have with eTech Insights to be able to, to do that effectively. Okay, thank you so much, Kayleen. 
All right, so we've come to the end of our first webinar. I want to thank all of our panelists for, for coming and talking to us today and all of our attendees for coming and participating. Unfortunately, we're not able to get to all of the questions because we're running out of time, but we want to advise you that we will be having these webinars two in October. The next one is next week, Thursday, Human Resource as a Service, Maximizing Efficiency and Improving Your Bottom Line. So we encourage you to tune into that one as well. So once again, thank you so much. And I'll now hand over to Miss Henry to close us out. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Kelly, for moderating this first webinar. We are very excited about our journey over the next few years, few months, sorry, um, with this webinar series. And over the next few years as we navigate this pandemic, because we are a resilient people in Jamaica and together we have soared so far. Uh, as I said in my opening, we ended the year last year with 43,000 employees and we, our deck has been reshuffled. So we, we've lost a few but we are on a journey to get back to that number and even more. And with your continued participation and support, we are definitely going to make that journey. So thank you very much, Peter Ryan. Very good, great presentation. Thank you, Kayleen, for the encouragement to our leaders out there. And Jackie, thank you for sharing your story. You are one of our successful ambassadors in this sector and we continue to hear very good stories coming out of Contacts 360. We are looking forward to seeing you again next week for the HR Business Forum. And we have a very exciting and informative series lined up for you um, under this theme, Resiliency, Business Growth, and the future. We expect that you will participate even more. For the next one, we're going to make sure that it's on YouTube and Facebook Live so that we can expand the reach and the participation. So again, thank you very much. Thank you to Karen, Karen Shields for the support and Kelly Reed for moderating this event. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you and have a great afternoon.